AT&T presents the strongest of the strong. Guys, in honor of Robbery Week, we're going to do something special. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you say Robbery Week? Rivalry Week. Rivalry. Rivalry Week. Rivalry. Rivalry Week. Rivalry. 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 Guys, it's Rivalry Week. Strong enunciation. Desmond wins. Who's strong enough to watch the college football playoff with Bo? Get stronger with AT&T, the network with the nation's strongest 4G LTE signal. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you today? It's great to see you. My name is David Emmert. I'm one of the pastors here. Very delighted that you're with us today. And you might be wondering why we're showing an AT&T commercial at the beginning of our sermon time. Um, we're in the midst of a sermon series on Colossians, and it's called Resolute. And it's about how we make the change that we need to make to become like the one who made us. And so we've been talking a lot about change over the last couple of days, or a couple of days together, I should say. We started off by talking about the fact that real resolute change, real change is only possible when it's founded on the hope of heaven that's fueled by the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's just no way that you're going to make the kind of changes in your life that you'd love to see. They're going to point us to being like the one who made us if that's not the foundation of everything that we're doing. We then went on to say that the roadmap, how do I know what changes in my life I need to make? And we said that the roadmap uh, for that is the Bible. The Bible reveals to us the will of God. And so that's a pretty important piece of this puzzle. How do I know what tweaks I'm supposed to make? What huge changes I'm supposed to make if I don't have a roadmap? And the Word of God is that roadmap. And then last week, Paul taught us that uh, the fuel for that change, the power to make that change possible, is the power of Jesus Christ. That the very power of Christ, the same power that Christ had, lives in us through the revelation, the power, the work of the Holy Spirit. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to make that change. So we've got a good foundation to build on. We've got a roadmap on what changes we need to make, and we've got the fuel, the power, the strength we need to make those changes. This ought to be a slam dunk, wouldn't you think? It ought to be. But we all know that uh, it's not as easy to make real transformative change as that. It's just not that simple. It seems that every time we sort of start down the path of making something substantive different in our lives, uh, we get blown off track. There are rivals in our way. Hence, rivalry week, wobbly week. That's what we're going to be talking about today and next week. We're going to look at, Paul's going to show us about two rivals that we're going to have to deal with, that we have to contend with if we want to see real change. Now, I'm probably going to say wobbly week we, wrong. <laughs> and so you won't just laugh at me and think it's just that easy. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say rivalry week three times fast and just see how you do. Okay. <laughs> All right, did you do okay or did you just butcher it like I did? Some of you do okay, some of you nail it, some of you not so much. Okay, so what are these rivals that stand between us and resolute change? I mean, what are they? What do they look like? How do I identify them? How do we, how do we overcome them? And the first one that Paul brings to our attention, I would submit, is huge for where we are as a culture today. I don't know if you have it noticed or not, but today in our society, we're in a sea of change. I mean, real change. I would submit it's not necessarily the same kind of change that we're talking about aspiring to make in our own lives. And so as we seek to live a, a lifestyle that's marked by change that makes us like the one who made us, we're having to do that kind of swimming upstream. And so if you're a student today, I want you to really listen because you all are sort of at ground zero of what we're talking about. If you're involved at FSU, if you're in that academic world, this is important for you today. If you're in our political landscape in some way, you work in the state in, in some capacity, this is a big day for you. I want you to pay attention, come with me uh, today because what we're talking about it's going to be huge for you today. So let's go together and let's take a look at this first rival to this kind of transformative change that we want to see happening in our life, okay? So Paul says, listen, the first change or the first rather rival to change that I want you all to understand, I want you to know about is 
competing worldviews. I want you to take a look at that. Okay, competing worldviews. Paul says, listen, uh, you're going to, as you live your life in Christ, you're going to have to do that while experiencing a cultural headwind, competing worldviews. The biblical worldview isn't the only worldview, and you're going to have to find a way to move forward, and if you want to see real change happen in your life, uh, in spite of those competing worldviews. Now, let me just start off by explaining what a worldview is, so that we're all talking about the same thing. Your worldview is your theory on how the world works. Every one of us has one. Let me just say it again. Your worldview is your theory on how the world works. It is your roadmap for living. And we've already talked about for us as believers, if we want to see real change take place, our roadmap has got to be biblical, right? So you you begin to notice immediately there's a little bit of a connection there. But your worldview is your roadmap for living. It helps you do things like define your goals. It helps you do things like understand why you're here, what the purpose of your life is. It helps you define your values and your priorities every single day. How you know what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, what you're going to make a high priority, what you're going to put off until later. Your worldview influences every single bit of that, and it's huge because your worldview is the foundation by which you define everything. Now, if you've got a biblical worldview, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, you're going to be able to kind of make those decisions from the right point of view, okay? Your starting point is going to be healthy. Your foundation in making those decisions is going to be healthy. But if your foundation for making the decisions about who you are and what your worldview is, if that's not strong and healthy, good luck. Good luck. And some of you are here today, and that's exactly where you are. Your worldview is being blown all over the map. I mean, every wind of change that comes through sweeps you up, and you're not really sure where you stand right now. And if that's you, I just invite you to have enough intellectual honesty to admit it, and let's work together a little bit uh, today. Now, here's the funny thing. Uh, Because we are modern people, we like to think that the world started with us, right? And we like to think that we are the first people to ever live in this kind of sea of change. And the reality is it's not true. It's a good thing that it's not true, because it's nice to learn from other people's mistakes, isn't it? Uh, Don't you like to learn from someone else's mistakes? Uh, CJ's benefited from several of my mistakes. Uh, painful for me, good for him. That's the way it works, right? He gets the, the benefit of watching me blow it. And so Paul is talking to people here in Colossians, to a group of people who live in a community where there's just this huge current of cultural change and where the worldview is skewed strongly against the people in the church. And he's going to talk to them about how they can navigate this important rival to real transformative change. So he's going to give us today just two quick ideas on what we've got to do to navigate those competing worldviews. So the first step is simply this. He says, I want you guys to remember the roadmap. So as as you're going along in your life and and you're dealing with all these huge storms of change coming against you, all these competing worldviews, I'm going to remind you, you got to hang on to the original roadmap. Here's what he says. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elemental forces of the world, and not based on Christ. So Paul says, look, I understand that there are all these competing worldviews out there. They're all vying for your time and for your attention, but I want you to be aware and be grounded and be strong against the ones that aren't based on Christ. Now here in the United States, here in America, we have a worldview, don't we? Our worldview in this country, the current worldview, is that of radical individualism. We love ourselves. That's really the bottom line. We think we're great. And we don't want anybody messing with the greatness. So we're radically individualistic. And we're so into ourselves that we've decided that you can do what you want as long as I can do what I want. This radical individualism has fueled a lot of spinoffs. There are things about our culture that really likes that rugged individual, radical individual approach. For example, capitalism. 
We all like our stuff. We want more stuff. We have an insatiable appetite for stuff. We want more stuff, cheap stuff, really fast right now. That's what we want. Amazon can bring you anything you want for free in two days, right? I mean, how do we live without that? I mean, you know, we don't even need to leave our house anymore. Fuzzy slippers are the only footwear you need to shop. You just go to Amazon and click. And two days later, someone brings it to you and hands it because, after all, it's all about you, right? This is individualism. I don't need to go out and be with the masses while I shop. I can do that by myself, okay? So that's a part of that whole individualism. We like our freedoms. We like the freedom to say what's on our mind. And if you don't believe me, go to the internet, go to any news site that you like, scroll on down to the comments section and read for about a half an hour. People love to be able to say whatever they want. Now they won't use their real names. You know, there'll be Joe Smith comment or whatever, right? But then they will blast you because we like our freedom of speech, but we also want our privacy, okay? So we're going to put those two things together. Now I'm anonymous on a comments board. I can say whatever is on my mind, okay? This is all part of this very individualistic worldview. Now, here's another thing that you need to understand. As Americans, we also believe that our culture is the best culture on the planet, in fact, our culture, according to us as Americans, is always right. And you say to myself, yourself right now, I say, wait a minute, we're talking about being inclusive and you know, learning from other cultures and all that. That's all done within the context that we know our culture is best, so you can bring your broken up culture on in here all you want, okay? Our culture is the right way. So our worldview is always right, and anything that con con conflicts with our worldview is always gonna be wrong. Now, here's what this means. This means that since our culture is always right, our culture now gets to decide what is right and what is wrong. So culture has decided this. It's no longer right and wrong. It's no longer grounded in something that's objective. It's now grounded in the subjectivity of the masses. And what this means is what was right and has been right forever can become wrong just like that just because society says that it's wrong now. So culture gets to make all of these decisions. Now this is complicated even more because for years we've told ourselves that America is a Christian nation. And so you put all this together and where does it lead you? It means that our culture expects Jesus to baptize whatever we say is right. And so now you hear things like this. You hear culture saying, hey, we've changed what we believe right and wrong is, and Jesus is loving, he's gonna be okay with it. So our culture is now trying to tell us what Jesus believes, and that's important because, after all, we're a Christian nation. And since we're a Christian nation, and Jesus is American, that means he's okay with whatever we're okay with. <laughs> that's where we are. Now, all of a sudden, you drop off us into the midst of this. And by that, I mean people who are trying to pursue real resolute change. Change that makes us more like the one who made us. And all of a sudden, we realize we're up against this competing worldview. And that worldview says, we're going to determine what is right and wrong, and you all have an archaic, outdated, objective standard of right and wrong in the Bible. And we reject that because we've evolved in our sensibilities, and we are now better able to say what is right and wrong than something that's, that's out of date. So we're going to reject that. In fact, we're going to tell you that your point of view is simply not welcome here. And the choice that we're being forced to make in our culture is to choose between embracing our own worldview or giving up on it and embracing our culture's point of view. Paul says, listen, you guys are swimming headlong into a current of contrary worldviews. And whatever you do, I want you to make sure that your worldview is not based on the elemental forces of the world or on human tradition or on empty deceit, but that your worldview is based on Christ. That's a very different worldview. Paul says, whatever you do, don't park your worldview at the door. Take it with you no matter what you are doing, no matter what you are pursuing in your life. You need to take your Christian worldview with you. Now listen, this is really important. That means that if you're in the sciences, maybe you're a doctor or a researcher at FSU or FAMU, 
If you're in the sciences, you need to take your Christian worldview with you when you go into the sciences. That means that if you're in, in a legal profession, perhaps you're an attorney, you need to pack up your Christian worldview and you need to take it with you into the legal profession. Maybe you're involved in the political world. It's, you know, we got a lot of people here. You work for the government. I'm blown away and I respect you all very, very much. I've had the occasion to discuss things with you all and, and specific ones of you. And I've been like, hey, is this bill going to pass? And, and some of you are like, well, that was bill 447 slash B4. And that was last year's bill. Now we've moved on to 447 G5, Dave. And then G5 is going to look a little bit like this. And you know all the details. And I'm looking at you going, what? But if you're in that political world, I would tell you that you need to pack your Christian worldview up and take it with you into the political arena. You need to have it with you. Let me explain to you how this works. Let's take science, for example. If you're involved in the sciences, you need to pack up your Christian worldview and you need to be Christian as you approach the sciences. What do I mean by that? I mean by that, that what if, when you, when you cracked open the world of scientific discovery, if your starting point was to simply say this, I believe that God created the heavens and the earth, so what we are encountering in this scientific discovery is a result of order, not of chaos. And that's your beginning point. That's your beginning point. Now, this is not new to me. Take a look at what Albert Einstein, would you all agree that Albert Einstein is a well-known scientist? This is what Albert Einstein said. The more I study science, the more I believe in God. I want to know how God created this world. I'm not interested in this or that phenomenon. In the spectrum of this or that element, I want to know his thoughts. The rest are details. Now, would you all agree that Albert Einstein pursued science at a high level? And he was able to do that while understanding that there was a creator. He was able to do that while pursuing the art of science from a vantage point of a believer that God made the heavens and the earth. Do you see how important that is? Paul says, listen, you can't go out into this world when there's all these competing worldviews and just get blown away by whatever comes along. You've got to be rooted in a worldview that's biblical and that's about Jesus. You've got to. It doesn't matter what field you're in. It doesn't matter if you're in the law profession. Can you imagine how, how different our world would be if lawyers and judges made the decision that right and wrong would be objectively discovered in the scripture? Can you imagine how different judgments and rulings would be if judges were serious about saying, we're going to be compassionate in the biblical sense of the word. We're going to be honest in the biblical sense of the word. We're going to pursue justice in the biblical sense of the word. I would submit to you, it would make our culture better. And many of you are lawyers and, and your attorneys and your judges, and you have the opportunity to recognize that an objective standard of truth and right and wrong would make our country better. Bring that with you. Bring that Christian worldview with you. And if you're in the political world, I know, I know that this is just dynamite, right? This is incredibly, incredibly divisive. But I would submit that the values of, of, of compassion and of honesty and of integrity and of serving others and of grace, I would submit to you that those qualities are necessary in our political process today. Last week, Marco Rubio, who's running for president, and this is not an endorsement of Marco Rubio, but last week, running for president, Marco Rubio in Hawaii, is conf in, in, uh, in Hawaii. That is the country, or the state rather, right between Iowa and Hawaii, okay? <laughs> That's where that is. He's in Iowa. He's in Iowa. Wava we week. He's in Iowa. And he's confronted by a young man who's an atheist who rightly wants to know what it would mean to have a believer in Jesus Christ as president. He wants to know if he's going to be represented. He wants to know if he has anything to fear and someone like Marco Rubio becoming president. Would it be good in a pluralistic society such as our own for someone who claims to be a Christian to become president? And I want you to hear what Marco Rubio has to say. He said, you shouldn't be worried about my faith influencing me. In fact, I think you should hope my faith influences me. Here's why. You know what my faith teaches me? 
My faith teaches me that I have an obligation to care for the less fortunate. My faith teaches me that I have an obligation to love my neighbor. My faith teaches me that I have an obligation to those who are hungry uh, to help and, and to are hungry to help and try to feed them. For those who are naked to help clothe them. My faith teaches me that I need to minister to those in prison. My faith teaches me that if we want to serve Jesus, we have to serve one another. I think you should hope that my faith influences me. Now, I'm not here, I'm not here to endorse a candidate. That's not my point. But I would submit to you that Marco Rubio understands something correctly. And that is his biblical worldview needs to be brought with him into the political process. It belongs there. And Paul is telling us that same thing. He brings it to the marketplace. I would submit to you that I would love to do business with people who have integrity and honesty and want to make sure that they're selling to me on a balanced scale. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you appreciate that as well? And those are the very virtues that we're supposed to have. Those are the kinds of changes that we're supposed to make if we're going to see resolute transformation in our lives. And so if you're in the private sector, you're selling a product, you're providing a service, you should do so with all of your heart in Christ. That should be your worldview. And Paul says, no matter what, I want you to understand something. You're going to have all these competing worldviews coming against you. All these competing worldviews, they represent a huge rivalry with the desire that we ought to have as believers in Jesus Christ to make real, resolute change. And you're going to have to stand firm against all of those worldviews, and you're going to have to pursue your faith in Jesus Christ with all of your heart, and there simply can't be any exceptions. He says, listen, I don't want you to be kidnapped, taken prisoner by something that isn't of Christ. You have to proactively work to guard your heart against those unbiblical philosophies. And so Paul says, listen, when you encounter something that's a part of the opposing worldview that we're dealing with as we move forward in our daily lives, and you're tempted to buy in, you're tempted to say, you know what, that makes sense to me. You need to stop and have a moment and just give yourself a bit of a gut check and ask yourself, is this going to make me more like Christ or less like Christ if I embrace this viewpoint? And that question has to be defined firmly by Scripture. It can't be based on an emotion or feeling. It's got to be biblically grounded. Paul says, listen, this whole idea that that our worldview alone is the only one that that we're going to ever encounter, it's nonsense. You've got to be prepared to deal with some competing worldviews. If you're going to do that, you've got to remind yourself what the map is really is, that biblical worldview that's given to us through the word of Jesus Christ. Now, he goes on, he presses further, he says, listen, another thing that you need to do here, if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, deal with these competing worldviews, worldviews, is that you've got to walk every day rooted in Jesus. So take a look at it, here it is, coming up there on the screen, boom, there it is, walk every day rooted in Jesus, every day. Now, the whole idea of walking is what I'm engaged in, okay? So Paul uses this term walk to describe everything that I do. So by his definition, when I get up in the morning and speak to my wife before I head off to work, that's part of my walk. When I go and I have breakfast and, and see people at Panera Bread or wherever I may be, that's part of my walk. When I'm driving uh, down Cap Circle Northeast, you know, at 7.35, that's part of my walk, right? And on and on it goes. Are you with me? He says, listen, if you're going to handle these competing worldviews in your walk, you've got to walk every day rooted in Jesus. Now, when I looked at that word rooted, it caught my attention. I began to think, why is it so important that my walk be rooted in Jesus? Why that metaphor? Why did he use that? What is it about roots that would make him say that's what we got to be? And so I thought, well, what do roots look like? And so I thought we'd just take a look at what roots look like. So here we got your basic ficus plant, all right, from our good friends at Home Depot. And uh, we're just going to get to the root of this thing here, one way or another. I may have to have somebody else. There we are. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to just see what the roots look like. I want to see the roots on this thing. So we're going to get rid of all the dirt. It's in the way. It's keeping me from seeing 
The, don't worry, Warren gets to clean it up. It's all good. Okay, a little bit more off there. Okay, so here we are. So I want you to take a look at these roots. Now, can we agree that's a lot of roots? That's a lot of roots. I mean, that's like a Phyllis Diller kind of root right there. If you're old enough, you know what Phyllis Diller means. That stuff's going everywhere. This bucket, I mean, look at it. It was full of roots, wasn't it? To be rooted then apparently means that it's going to go everywhere. I mean, like, everywhere. Like, it's going to leave no stone unturned. And so when I think about my life, if I want it to be rooted in Christ, that would mean that Christ, the things of Christ, my worldview, right, my biblical worldview, this hope that I'm going to found all chance of any real resolute change taking place, it's going to have to go everywhere in my whole life. It's got some big areas, like that guy right there. It's a pretty good root for this plant. But look at all the little areas. I mean, nothing is left out. So if Christ is going to be rooted in my life, that means it's got to go everywhere. It's going to be in my relationship with my wife, right? I mean, that's not going to be left out. It's going to be in my relationship with my son, with my daughter. And that's not going to be left out. It's in my relationship in work. It's in my driving habits, it's in whether or not I pay taxes in April, it goes absolutely everywhere. Nothing escapes that. Nothing is left out. Paul says, listen, if you want to be a person who walks with Christ every day, you've got to be rooted in him. It has to run everywhere. There are no exemptions. So that means that Every day, everything I do, it's got to be about Jesus. If I'm going to be a doctor, we talked about that before, well, then I've got to be a Christian doctor first, right? If I'm going to be a lawyer, then I've got to be a Christian lawyer first. If I'm going to be an engineer, I've got to be a Christian engineer first. If I'm going to be a salesperson, I've got to be a Christian salesperson first. If I'm going to, you get where I'm going with this, right? If I'm going to be a mom or a dad, I've got to be a Christian mom or dad first. If I'm going to be a student in school and college, I've got to be a Christian student first. That means every step I take in my walk is filtered through the lens of Jesus Christ. So when I go out on a date, my first thought is, how am I going to be a Christian date tonight in this experience? I'm going to bring Christ with me. He's first and foremost. That root's going to run everywhere. It's going to be there. If I'm going to work and I've got to deal with a really difficult customer, then I'm going to ask myself, how do I bring Christ into this really difficult relationship? How? Because I've got to be a Christian business person first. That's, that's job one. If I'm dealing with this out-of-control employee that really drives me crazy, I've got to ask myself, well, what do I need to be doing there as a Christian employee? How do I deal with that person in that regard? Because if I'm an employer, then I've got to be a Christian employer first. Paul says there's no way that we can do what we need to do here if we're not rooted firmly in Christ. Look at what he says in Colossians 2, 6 and 7. He says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus of the Lord, walk in him, rooted and build up in him, established in faith, just as you were taught, overflowing with gratitude. This is fundamental then, if we're going to succeed in uh, pursuing resolute change when our worldview is being competed with constantly. I've got to be walking in Christ, rooted in him, and it has to affect every area of my life. Notice there that Paul also says that my attitude in all of this is going to be one of gratitude. I'm going to have this sense of gratitude everywhere I go. That means that as I'm pursuing that difficult relationship with that employee, I am remembering, I'm mindful of the fact that Christ has been patient with me. He has been gracious to me. And I'm going to be grateful for what Jesus has done for me. And that's going to influence how I deal with this employee. Do you get what he's saying? 
but there's not going to be an area left out. No stone is going to be left unturned. Throughout my life, top to bottom, every area, every facet, I'm going to dedicate it to the cause of Christ. It's going to be about Jesus, and it's going to be borne out with the spirit of gratitude because of what Jesus has done for me. Paul goes on and he describes exactly what Jesus has done for us. Look at what he says in verse 9. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him. Wow. Who is the head over every ruler and authority. Having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Wow. That's what Jesus has done for us. That's what Jesus has done for us. It's what he did for me. I remember very clearly when it occurred. I was a little boy, and I was raised in a Christian home to two amazing, loving, wonderful, godly parents. And uh, they made sure that I was in church every single Sunday. You all have heard me tell you this before. There was no reason to miss church, period. My dad was a doctor, and it was in the days of penicillin, and dad was convinced that penicillin would solve every problem. And so if I woke up in the morning and I wasn't doing too well, dad, and on a Sunday morning, dad said, hey, there's two things you need. One, you need a shot of penicillin in church. That's it. That'll solve every problem. That'll cure every ill. And let me tell you something. Penicillin hurts, okay? You don't want that shot. I was cured quickly on many occasions. So I went to church. It just, that's just the way it was. My mom and dad not only took me to church so that I would hear about Jesus, but they lived that in front of me all the time. Now, don't misunderstand. They were not perfect people. They made plenty of mistakes. They got lots of things wrong. But my mom and dad loved me, and they loved God, and they wanted to make sure that I got that message crystal clear. And so they were always telling me about Jesus. I don't ever remember a moment in my home that Jesus wasn't talked about and celebrated. It's just who I was. I was just bathed in it. I remember one night, I was a little boy, and uh, I went into my mom's bedroom and we started talking about Jesus. And like I said, that wasn't the first conversation. But that night, it clicked for me. And my mom and I knelt on her side of the bed and she led me to Christ right there. And as a little boy, I made a decision and that decision set me on a path toward real transformative change. Now, it hasn't always been perfect. There have been some twists and some turns along the way. There have been some good steps. There have been some not so good steps. There have been plenty of things I've had to apologize for, probably plenty more that I should apologize for, but that's been the path. That's been the journey. I look back at it, and I say, all of that's possible because of what Christ has done for me, and he's invited me to be his and to be with him and to walk with him. On the day that I was baptized, when I was a little boy, much like the little girl that we saw baptized in the first service, that was a way of just driving a flag into the ground, saying that I've been adopted into this kingdom, the kingdom of God, and I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm just passing through the United States. And so if my worldview is going to look like my citizenship, then my worldview has to look like the worldview of heaven, of God. Why? Because Jesus Christ has changed me completely, and I'm grateful to him. And that, that's who I am. That's made all the difference in the world. And I hope for many of you, and I look around the room, and I see some heads nodding up and down, and you have boring testimonies just like mine. Dull, boring, uneventful, right? Right? No drugs, no wild rock and roll, no, you know, just, just mom, dad, love Jesus, taught me about Jesus, and now I love Jesus too. Praise God for boring testimonies, right? <laughs> Praise God for that. And maybe that's your story. Maybe you're here today and, you know, you look at your life and you say, man, I am so convinced, so convinced that the only way that I'm going to move forward in this life is to base my life firmly on the worldview that's grounded in Scripture and is all about Jesus. 
And man, I want to celebrate that with you. But maybe your story is one of having been blown off course. Paul says it can happen. It can happen just like that. And if you're not careful, there are so many philosophies. If you're not careful, there are so many empty thoughts. If you're not careful, there are so many deceitful things in our world that are competing for your attention. And if you're not careful, they will come along and they will become a huge rival for the change that God wants to see wrought in your life. Huge. And maybe, if you had enough intellectual honesty to admit it, you've been a little lax on the maintenance. You haven't stayed vigilant there. You've lost sight of the real road map, you know? You've made that misstep. And today would be a good day for you to say, from this moment forward, I'm going to walk like someone rooted in Jesus. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to get back on that path. And man, if you make that decision today, I just want you to know I celebrate that with you. It's a great time, okay? It's a great time to do that. Others of you, though, maybe you've never taken that step. You are still buried beneath the weight of the very kinds of competing worldviews that we've been talking about. And because of that, your own sense of right and wrong, it's being blown all over the map. You don't know what to believe. I'd love to have a moment of your time. Why don't you come down after we're done in just a few moments and let's connect and let's talk about what it means to be rooted in Christ and to have a relationship with him that gives you the foundation to see real change made in your life, the kind of change that lasts and lasts and lasts. Not the kind of change that just is here today and gone tomorrow, but transformation. I mean, something real so that you leave a different person. I would love to have that talk with you. We can talk about what it means to be forgiven of your sins and to walk in a whole new way of life. I'd love to have that conversation with you. So what I want to do right now, if you would, just kind of bow your head right now. And if you're in that first category and you're thinking, hey, I have grown up in the faith and by God's grace, I'm on track and I just want to be thankful to him for what he's done. And you just, why don't you just voice that attitude, that, that sense of gratitude right now. And be thankful. And if you're here today and you've been blown off course, maybe your story sounds a lot like mine. You know, you got off to a really good early start, but since then, not so great. I would just like to invite you that today's a great day to make a change. Today's a great day to say, man, from this day forward, I know what I'm going to be about. I know what I'm going to be rooted in. I know what I'm going to be grounded in. Go ahead and do that today. And if you're here today and you're thinking, I have no idea where I'm even going in life. I need to be grounded in something that's going to give me the ability to make some real changes, some real transformative changes. Well, then today, today's the day that we start that. And you just go ahead and pray about that now. Tell God that that's the kind of change you want to make right now. Let me pray with you. Father, we love you. We're very grateful for all that you've done for us. You're a gracious and good God. And you have shown us how we ought to live. That's what the word is all about. It's our roadmap. And you've empowered us to follow you through the strength of Jesus Christ. You've placed the Holy Spirit in our hearts. It's there quickening us, encouraging us, exhorting us to do what honors you. Father, in spite of that, some of us have been blown off course. We live in a world that uh, doesn't you know, agree with a biblical worldview at all. The competition is stiff. And maybe, just maybe, the maintenance quite hasn't been there. We haven't minded the store very well. And so we kind of lost sight of the roadmap. And Father, I just pray that for those in this room, and that's their story, that today's a new day for them. And they can be assured of your grace and your freedom and your forgiveness. And today's a whole new day. Father, for others in this room, though, it's a step that desperately needs to be taken. They've never done anything but flounder from one worldview to the next. So, Lord, we pray that today's the day they make a change. That they make the decision to build their hope on eternity 
through Christ Jesus. And that today's the day they make that switch. So Lord, we just pray that you will move and we give you glory for the time together this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name.